Well, there we go. I'm uh, trying to get some interesting things up on the screen. I'm sure I'll get a little bit better as the program goes forward, but we do have a new format today. David Shapiro and Adrian Saville, who are our uh, expert guests. David, as always, Adrian guesting for us this week, and then we have a little later in the show, we will be joined by Stephen Saar, Chief Executive of Aspen, of course, which released its um, prelim results last week, the year to end June. So we'll be getting some more insight into that. Lots of excitement uh, on around those results, particularly on the sale for about 650 million euros of a big operation in Europe. But before we get into that, Stuart Lohman uh, will be giving us some background on, or rather insights into how you can pose your questions. And remember, the first, not remember, but the first 15 minutes, uh, we're going to be going back uh, over the past week with David and Adrian on the major investment related information and we'll be asking uh, questions of them on that and then uh, we we dedicate the rest of the show to Aspen and the results and I think there's some really really useful insights there about how COVID-19 has affected pharmaceutical companies in particular but Stu do you want to take us through how the questions can be asked? Excellent, thanks, Alec. Uh, just some housekeeping quickly uh, to the attendees. If you can see David, Adrian, and Alec and hear my voice, can you just give a high five for us, please, just so that we know it's coming through loud and clear? Uh, let's have a look here. We've got some high fives. That is on the control panel. There we go. I've got a few coming through, so that's really good. As Alec mentioned, that's like to keep it conversational. So please, just on that same control panel, there's a little questions drop down. Please plug them in as soon as they come to mind so that Alec can get them through early because we do seem to run out of time towards the end usually. But Alec, everything's good this time, so good luck. Thank you, Stu. And I've got the uh, the questions bar opened on my side. So as soon as you send them through, I'll uh, break into the conversation and pose your questions. Very easy, the little question mark, literally click it and type in the information and away we go. So here we are for a Rational Radio for this week. Uh, David and Adrian. Uh, before we get into the discussion on Aspen, uh, I guess the feature of last week was banking shares. Uh, in our, uh, well, in, in the questions that we get in our monthly portfolio, uh, we often get asked about South African banking shares. David, uh, the honor of kicking off, what did you think <laughs> of those, uh, those bank uh, results? And is it time now to follow Koki Koiman into them? I, I don't know if Cook is going into local bank shares. He's certainly going into global bank shares. I I was uh, not disappointed. I'm very worried about the bank results, uh, particularly the size of the uh, provisions that they're making against impairments. In other words, you know, if you look at modern accounting standards, um, Alec, you have to look forward and make provisions against what you think are going to be non-payments. You know, I'm, I'm a great believer that your balance sheet and your financial statement should represent what the company believes it's worth now. Not, you know, in other words, not finessing it to a point where, um, <coughs> excuse me, you can write off assets and hopefully recover them somewhere down the line. So if this is a true reflection of what banks see as unfolding in the future, then it's a very worrying scene that we are seeing. And I think they express it in the commentary, you know, the worries about um, individuals losing their jobs, not being able to pay, uh, not, you know, in other words, really living, I wouldn't say on the breadline, but living under very difficult circumstances and also reflects on the economy. So I'm cautious about where um, the banks are at the moment. The share prices are holding. I'm not questioning that, but you know, this might be the bottom in terms of a share price, but that doesn't mean that it's necessarily the bottom of the market. And I don't expect a massive and quick turnaround uh, soon. So I'm very cautious about the financial numbers that we saw uh, last week. Adrian? Hey, Alec, we've uh, recently finished uh, a piece of work which uh, assesses the vulnerability or sensitivity of industries uh, to economic circumstances. And 
a standout feature of this work, I think, you know, from uh, from a revenue perspective, it's almost self-evident who's going to be uh, hurt the most or lifted the most in depressed or buoyant circumstances. You know, in the miners, the commodity businesses, the resource companies are at the leading edge um, or the bleeding edge uh, in downtimes, and they get wind beneath their wings in uptimes. Uh, financials sit uh, with a degree of defensiveness because a lot of your you know, a lot of your book is is established and it's and it's and it's annuity in nature rather than transactional. Um, you know that's the nature of the industry. But the the standout feature for us in this work, and uh, we're talking about global banks here rather than South African banks. I can come to that in a moment. But the standout feature is that bank earnings. Uh, are very reactionary uh, and extremely sensitive to uh, economic circumstances, far more reactionary and far more sensitive than you, you might sort of suggest at first blush. And this is because non-performing loans, when they come, and Dave is, a, is I think, is pointing to this, non-performing loans, when they come, are out of your hands. And uh, I think that the South African environment, as stressed as it is, what what worries me in the banking circumstance is there have been periods of forgiveness and a little bit of support and relief and payment holidays. Uh, and that reflects to some extent what's happening uh, globally. Um, but I'm not sure that we've seen the, the full extent yet. And the, the, to the extent that we have seen uh, what's coming, it's concerning. You know, yeah. I, I think banks have got some hard yards to do. That's interesting because there is another opinion that the banks have actually written off more than what they needed to. In other words, they've been very conservative. From what you outlining, Adrian, that wouldn't be your view. Well, I, can I give you the economist's answer and say, yes, I think some of them have been uh, reasonably uh, front footish. And I think, you know, EPSA uh, stands out as having been, uh, you know, on. Uh, on that side of the spectrum. Others, uh, are, you know, I would put a bigger question mark over. The, the, the real difficulty in this environment is visibility is so poor um, that it really is hard to know uh, what, what this time next year is gonna look like. Uh, you know, that's how tough visibility is. Can we really believe that the uh, domestic economy is going to have some bounce factor, that the infrastructure spend is on its way, that some of those uh, important policy initiatives are about to be implemented, and that ease of doing business is going to lift, the spectrum is going to be released, and so on? I mean, the visibility is just so poor that uh, it's, it's, it's not easy to know what to make of these bank numbers. David, uh, I'm going to pick up on the screen now uh, next week's guest, who is Alan Pullinger from First oh, Rand, oh. Uh, because the First Rand stock has been an art performer uh, for most of the time that we have, uh, I hope you can see it, there, there it is, oh. uh, for most of the time that, that uh, we've been covering um, the banks in the last even five, seven, ten years, really. Oh. However, it's still around half the price, a little over mm. half the price, of where it was pre-COVID. Now, if COVID has wiped out half of the value of First Rand, mm -hmm. then this is a, a, a reasonable mm -hmm. decision by Mr. Market. But if not, then surely we're looking at a stock here that for the long term must be offering some value. Yeah, it's hard to determine what the long term is. And as Adrian says, visibility is so poor. So you don't know what that long term is going to look like. And, you know, there's another factor which is fascinating, Alec, and you probably talk about it all the time, is the emergence of alternative banks or other, other factors in this area, you know, other businesses that are now covering uh, lending, covering investment, covering so many other, so many other areas uh, of the market against which they're going to find challenges. And you might find in these times where banks are very nervous and very cautious, other, other people are stepping in and starting to lend money to those businesses under stress in much more innovative ways. My worry is that if you looked at that long chart, we've been going sideways for some time now. Uh, so there's no breakout. It doesn't look 
like sentiment is changing or people feel that uh, sentiment is going to change, you know, and, and that's why I'm saying exercise caution. I, I, I trust the market because I trust the market in the sense that people actually take money out of their back pockets or investors take money out their back pockets and make a decision. You know, we don't write reports. It's very easy to write reports. It's another thing to actually invest in the company. So I'm I'm cautious for the very fact that we can't look backwards. We can't go back in history and um, assume that there's going to be reversion to the mean or that history is going to repeat them so, uh, re repeat itself. So I think in the circumstances we find ourselves here, particularly with the uh, outcome of the lockdown, I I remain very very cautious. And if you're going, you don't need to do anything now. I would just just, I would remain out and see what the so-called long-term future is or, or how the long-term actually unfolds before we make a decision. As you can see from and this graph, could, could I make a, sorry. of course, but it's six and a half year uh, mm -hmm. since the share price has been at this level. So you're buying mm -hmm. first RAND or the company it was in 2014. That's going to be a lot of loss to uh, these smaller banks. Adrian? Mm. Alec, I was just going to make the point uh, in passing that you're absolutely right. I mean, this is a, uh, this is a high quality bank that's uh, had a substantial fall and it's taken us back a long way in terms of, of, of price. Um, there are other big banks that have fallen by about the same on even less demanding uh, evaluations. Uh, and in particular, Nedbank and APSA are trading at less than their book value, um, which uh, which allows you for you know, some room margin of error. Uh, you know, to Dave's point about um, you know, it, uh, it, it's it, it's hard to know what's in the price and what's not in the price. You know, who's putting their money in their pocket, their hand in their pockets, and putting money on the table, and. If those hands uh, are to be believed, uh, if the pockets are deep, then <laughs> then move on. But if the hands are to be believed, then uh, you're buying banks at less than their, their net asset value. In the, in the long term, that's a really good entry point for banks. Well, as mentioned, we will be talking with Alan Pullen next week. He's going to be uh, in Stephen Saad's hot seat. And then we'll also have uh, Corky Koyman, who's a focused uh, banking analyst uh, who will be helping us through that. Before we move on to speak with Stephen, financial results were out last week. Adrian, uh, you've had the chance to look at them. You are a shareholder at Canon Asset Management. Were you happy? Yes, I'm delighted, uh, you know, to be well to be having this conversation with Stephen. So it's a much better time than a few years back, um, <laughs> and we haven't been shareholders for a long time. Uh, in fact, we used the the, the substantial market pressure uh, to become shareholders, and you know, no doubt, uh, you know, that was an extremely difficult period uh, for for the business. And you know, one never wants to sort of take uh, advantage of um, uh, of uh, unfortunate circumstances. But you know, more than an unfortunate unfortunate circumstance, we think that the market had got Aspen's price very, very wrong, uh, and it was a fantastic uh, opportunity to buy into a well-run uh, global business. Uh, and I'm not saying well run uh, because Stephen's on the call. <laughs> I've said this with him on or off the call. Uh, it's an exceptional business with a superb long record. Um, we love the portfolio. And if you do a sum of the parts valuation, it is still worth substantially more than, than today's share price. And you can buy it at 10 times earnings. Uh, the results made for, for pleasing reading. Well, we're going to see what you think after you've had the chance to hear what uh, what Stephen has come back with. But there is a question here from Peter Bodel, and David, maybe you can pick up on this. He says, in the past, I was advised to hold 30% of my portfolio local and 70% offshore. What mm. would the panel advise going forward post-COVID? I don't want to spend too much time on this question <laughs> because we, we do want to get into, into Aspen in just a moment. What's your thought? Me, I'm I'm a hundred percent offshore, <laughs> but um, so I, he's been I, I, to I, the wrong I, person. <laughs> <laughs> I just love the businesses that we're getting, but that's why I've got a lot of questions to ask Stephen. I mean, it relates to to things. You know, when Stephen's gone through a rough time, and uh, he's the right kind of manager to be 
in charge of uh, Aspen at the moment. He's always a dynamic thinker and always thinks his way out. And and I think this is going to work in his favour now. And I've always had high respect for it. But I think the questions that I'm going to ask, and and believe me, offshore, I'm invested very heavily in the pharmaceutical area. You know, so a lot are going to be around the uh, around the dynamics of what's happening in the global economy at the moment in that area. And I think it relates to Aspen as well. So uh, I am invested in pharmaceuticals in a big way. Quickie from you, Adrian, seventy thirty. Or would you be like David and go 100% offshore? Yes, I'll give you two parts to the answer. The one is you always need to match your assets and liabilities. So if you uh, if you have 100% South African RAND liabilities that your monthly expenses, your school fees, your retirement uh, spending is all RAND based, then you need to be very careful about holding it in another currency because if, that, if the RAND suddenly strengthens, uh, your retirement asset has just collapsed and the RAND can strengthen, believe it or not. Um, so always think about matching assets and liabilities. So that would be the one perspective. The other is if you lived on Mars, how much would you allocate to South Africa? Less than half a percent. So anything over half a percent is actually an overweight position in South Africa once you <laughs> match assets and liabilities. Uh, a quick follow up from Peter. He says, uh, David, would your portfolio include 10 cent? Oh, of course. No, oh, absolutely. I love the business. Okay. You know, yeah, it's the best gaming company you can buy. Uh, gaming is 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 uh, just one of these areas of the market that's just going to attract more and more money. And uh, ahead of the pack is Tencent. So just uh, it's a it's a wonderful business. Stephen Saad is joining us now. Stephen, uh, we're just going to have to get your uh, your camera on and uh, get your Comms going, but I know we have tested it, so everything should be working. Am I am I there, Alec? Uh, you are to. Uh, sorry, I'm just taking one second. Uh, David, can you see? Can He's you see Stephen? Hmm? Is Stephen's there? there. Wonderful. Hmm. You can also see a cap in the background doing the garden, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> going, going all the way back to 1996, Stephen. And uh, if only I suppose you'd bought any time between 1996. And uh, when was uh, we were last at this level in 2012? So we spoke about the banks yeah. a bit earlier, um, and that's really one of the reasons why I, I guess there's so much interest in Aspen at the moment. You've got lots of lots of fans. But just to go back a little to the uh, to, to last week's results, what was the reaction like? Uh, or what's your reaction like to people like Adrian who own your stock? Uh, were they universally delighted? at the the numbers or were there uh, some critics you know i've only i've been involved in all the one-on-ones and you see your major shareholders and we've if you go through our presentation over the last two years and you see what we said we were going to do and what we did do uh, we've been absolutely consistent in delivering on what we said including saying we will resolve europe by september now bear in mind you're trying to do a transatlantic transaction without getting on an airplane um, I think many other people might have said to you, listen, I think, I think, would you mind giving us a bit of time here? We also, we did overperform um, in terms of, you know, we thought we'd be relatively flat with the prior year, and then we updated that to growth. And uh, we grew 9%. Um, some of it was RAND depreciation, because we like, we are 85% uh, offshore. Um, and, and, but that was only in the last quarter. But yes, we're very, very pleased with both the operational and where we are strategically. Yeah. Adrian, you've got the first the first part. Well, uh, you know, I've, I've followed uh, Aspen very closely over many, many years. Uh, I know a guy called Gus Attridge, who some years ago, <laughs> around about 1996, said to me, I should buy as much of this as I could possibly afford. Um, very and, unlike us. <laughs> and you did. <laughs> and, you know, we're talking about a share price that was in the rands then. Uh, you know, now it's earning multiples of that in, in, in earnings. What, you know, what I would be keen to know, uh, Stephen, is f two issues. The one is where you went through that period of uh, specific market stress. Um, 
what was your thinking uh, in terms of the portfolio? Uh, what was the what was the movable and what was the non-negotiable? Um, and now that we've got a a revised portfolio, what do you think the sum of the parts of that portfolio is? Should yeah, I be so paying ten rand for those earnings? Uh, should I be paying ten times for those earnings? Yeah, well, if you if you look at it, we're probably sitting at eight times EBITDA multiple if you take our earnings and you see where the rand is and you might probably be paying eight times EBITDA. Um, I think most of our transactions have been done at sort of double digits, 10, 12 times. The milks were done at like 30 times EBITDA, I think it was, or more, maybe 40 times. So these were these multiples, even if you put a multiple of 12 times over our earnings, just and bear in mind we didn't sell the oh, the the, the businesses that we overperformed it. These are businesses which we weren't able to perform at the same level as the rest of our business. Um, you're going to get a very different share price. Maybe it's over 200 rand. But you know, I'm not here to really talk about EBITDA. You know, I sit and try and run this business and focus on where we're going to go. We've had, uh, you know, we've had to focus very heavily on, you know, a change in strategy and, and how we manage a change in strategy through really tricky times. David. I'm here. Sorry. I, no, I want to ask, your... you know, you can't take anything away from Stephen. I mean, they have managed themselves through a very, very difficult time, which hit them in 2018. I think everything was against the pharmaceutical industry. Stephen was doing the right thing. And Stephen, I'm not talking for you, but, you know, as a watcher, uh, transforming the company from what was a generic company into a world class pharmaceutical business and things went uh, against you. I don't think it was all your, you know, in fact, very little was your fault, but you got caught with debt, which you had to use in order to to uh, transform the company. My, you're in a you're in a decent shape in the sense now that you're now selling into areas in which you've got the scale. My, the big worry, and this is more of a generic question, is that how do you see drug prices? I mean, we hear Trump all the time going on. We hear governments all the time about wanting to reduce drug prices, you know, uh, and bring down the cost. Of course, that's going to hurt your margins. You know, it's a political issue as well. But it's very important for you that, that um, you know, drug prices are maintained and that, in fact, you generate the kind of margin so that you can reinvest in the business. What, what, what's your take on drug prices and specifically, uh, you know, with a view to you to where you want to take the company? So I think it's, I mean, your, I think your comments are all fair, David, and right, particularly when the government's a single payer. So many European markets, for example, the government are your single payer. I mean, I've heard, I don't think I've heard an American president not talk about drug pricing coming down. So that's sort of, Everyone, it's, it's the easiest target, of course. But I think when you come, I think, you know, there's there's this panic about COVID and austerity and, and all those things. But at some point, you're going to get less tax rate. And to balance your budget, one of the easiest ways to balance it is to attack drug prices. So I am concerned with governments a single pay. And I've tried to position Aspen into a lot of the emerging markets uh, where people go to private hospitals. They, they still want a quality product. But mostly we've made it affordable. So when we're in anesthetics, we, when changing our model from commoditization to specialty, we've gone into where we're strong in a, a volume, volume businesses. So we sell our anesthetics, anesthetics sell at a dollar. If you're doing a twenty thousand dollar operation, which you've got to go to hospital, all the rest, you're not you really are not looking at that dollar there because that's gotta to, gotta to put you to sleep and it's gotta wake you up. So so you really don't want to have a mess up in that process, not because you try to save 10 uh, uh, I'm trying, I'm trying to. It, it was a painful metamorphosis. I often say to people, you know, look, we went into a cocoon for a while, and I know a lot of you thought we weren't coming out, and at best we were coming out a moth, and we were targeting a butterfly. So, so it was a painful, painful process and metamorphosis, but a critical process because the importance of what we've done is it gives us five, 10 years growth going forward. We've got ourselves into a position and a stra in, into an area where other people, it's very hard to get in a high barrier. You see the pain we've been through, and we're number one in the world uh, in anesthetics and two in uh, in anticoagulants at that stage. With all of those volumes, how painful it was. So I think we, we've we done the right things. I'm very comfortable. We're in a good space. You saw when, um, when COVID came, I literally 
I'm not joking, had heads of state phoning me all the time, asking me for their share of our anesthetics. Then you saw what happened with dexamethasone. And, you know, our facilities are shaped for vaccines. We've made sure we can make vaccines in our facility. That's one of our objectives was to get into involved in vaccines. So I think that will differentiate us from commodity and commoditized players and will give us that pricing that we need in order to be able to reinvest and to keep our margin. And if you look through the business over all the years, we've been able to hold in, in spite of waves of pricing and pricing increase. Stephen, dexamethasone is, a, is an interesting one because here in South Africa, we know that our, our clinicians have been using it early on. Uh, and we also know that, that Aspen produces it. How, how does it affect a business like yours when an old drug like dexamethasone suddenly becomes very popular? Uh, look, it's a, it's, it's a small tablet. It's in, it's in a milligram, tiny little cap tablet. So you can make it quite quickly and easily. Um, it does affect you because you start to look and say, gee, have I, have I got enough stock? Because it's it's not about, you know, you send me a 10 cents a tablet. It's not about the massive earnings increment or turnover increment. It's a, totally about saving lives and, you know, WHO phoning you and et cetera, et cetera. So a good, uh, uh, we were able to scale up. Um, we weren't prepared for that type of demand, but we were fortunate enough to, to have enough chemicals and enough manufacturing capacity and capability to prioritize and make what the world needed. It's amazing how many lives have been sold, I mean saved rather, just by that one uh, development. So it's it's uh, sitting in your shoes, it must be extremely satisfying. But Adrian, I'm sure you have a follow-up. Yeah, satisfying, but I tell you, it's very, very tricky, Alec. I mean, the, the anesthetic process, and the, I can't tell you the pressure it puts on your supply chain and the responsibility it placed on organization. It was just absolutely insane. Sorry, Ed. You know, well, Alec, we, we were talking about, uh, you know, tech stocks uh, just in the run-up uh, to, to the show um, uh, offline. And one of the tricky aspects of working out uh, where tech uh, is going is that you've got disruptions going on and those disruptions may, might take the form of business models and it's now all about platforms or it might be a particular uh, application that spectacularly disrupts an industry. Stephen, I'm interested uh, from uh, the perspective of the pharmaceutical industry, surely COVID is a disruptor and uh, if it is a disruptor, I'm saying surely, I'm answering the question, is COVID a disruptor to industrial structure? Can Should we expect more M&A uh, or is it you want to be more diversified? Is, is geography the risk? Uh, is it a particular drug that's a risk or is it policy and regulators that are a risk? Yeah, so are you talking, Adrian, from an Aspen perspective or, or just generally about yeah, Has the world been disrupted for you? Yeah, the world has been disrupted. There's been massive uh, uh, jumps in the supply chains and changes in the supply chain. I think also we're finding multinational pharmaceuticals that had used China and India extensively on our really cautious. I mean, you've seen all, this, all the political stuff, but also during COVID, they actually suspended supply. Uh, so we, you will see that in our results, our manufacturing business increased, and, and that was a lot of it was driven by multinationals now saying, "Listen, I, I want to, I want to buy from somebody who's not going to cut my supply." So that was uh, that, that from that perspective, hopefully it's been positive, permanent adjustments um, in the supply chain, that it's not just how much cheaper can I get it, but can I get the quality, and can I be cert can I get certainty around it? Uh, from from our perspective. Um, in terms of how we've looked at this, we, you know, there's massive jolts coming from COVID. We don't know where all those jolts are going to hit and impact economically, but uh, you know, I do think that those single payer markets are going to feel pricing pressures, and so that might fundamentally change some of the markets. But the one thing, I mean, I've done this for over 20 years. We had all our ups and downs. The one thing that's been absolutely consistent is the the rise in a middle class in emerging markets. Absolute numbers increase. It might be 40% and it might still be 40%, but the population has grown. Uh, and 
everybody wants to get a medicine that's of the highest possible quality affordably. And that is what our entire business is based on, Adrian, is getting millions and millions of products so that we can sell 10 million or 100 million dexamethasone. I don't even discuss it. It's not, you know, it's just lots of tablets and it's not a huge turnover impact. But when you add it all together and it comes into billions, suddenly you realize, oh my God, we're selling 100 million rand or more a day, every day, 24 seven across the world. Um, and that's what gives us a, a huge degree of comfort about the sort of breadth of our business. Um, I think in focusing it, Adrian, reshaping, it's, it's also a big focus into, if you look at our top five markets now, it's uh, South Africa and Australia all aware of, but the other three, maybe people might not guess straight away. It's uh, China, it's Mexico, it's Brazil. Uh, it's, it's no longer France, Germany, the UK, and all of those markets, we've had capability and growth. So I think we, you know, I think in terms of, you know, disruptive activity, et cetera, I believe that our opportunity lies in getting stronger in those markets. Other people need partners. They're all focusing on Collegy, the latest, greatest on Collegy products. So uh, they need partners in those small, in those, I put in, in Vidcom, some of the smaller markets that excludes China. A lot of them are very in, uh, invested in China. <laughs> There's a question from Jarina van der Baer, which is a little um, a little removed from what we've just been discussing. But she wants to know, are you still making Lenin's medicine? Yes, with a huge amount of focus. That's not removed. It's our heritage. It's a culture. In fact, we nearly called Aspen Lenin when we first started 20 odd years ago. We nearly called it Lenin, but we were very worried about the potential associations of Lenin on a global scale. So... <laughs> so <laughs> <laughs> but yes, we make all those Lenin Dutch medicines and they are bigger now than they've ever been historically. And uh, those are the type of brands that we like investing in. They are brands. They don't get commoditized. People buy them. You can put some support behind them. And so that is a lot of what our regional brands business is having brands like that within our business. Does it travel, Lenin's, from South Africa? No, it hasn't, but I do believe that it can travel up into Africa. I do think there's value in, in looking more broadly. David, your question? I think if, I, if, I, if I'm not mistaken, I think uh, I used to do the audit of Lenin. If it was part of the Adcock Ingram group, I think I, I, I remember doing Lenin laboratories and different Lenin uh, products. Stephen, emerging markets, I'm, you know, I'm glad you mentioned Mexico, Brazil. Because I think the immediate concern is that when you say you're going to focus on areas where you, um, you know, out, where, where you've got the capacity or where you've got the the reach, um, Africa. Um, the question I was going to ask is Africa because we're suddenly seeing um, the flee or the you know companies fleeing from Africa. We've seen shop right now closing down Nigeria. We've seen a lot of other issues. Um, China and, and Southeast Asia remain your probably your big areas. But how do you see Africa? I mean, is it still an issue for you or 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 is there growth? And I'm talking vis-a-vis -vis what we are seeing with the retailers and other businesses now who are starting to find it a little uncomfortable trading there. Look, Africa is really tricky to trade in. Uh, it's not one market. Uh, the lo logistics and distribution, distribution really tough and found um, we found the, the business in Sub-Saharan Africa also very particularly difficult in Nigeria. Just to get your money out, David, was not mm. easy. Mm. Uh, so we, we sort of slowed down a bit in Nigeria, but we put roots down. In fact, we've got our own facilities in Kenya, uh, in Nairobi, in uh, Dar es Salaam in Tanzania, and Accra in Ghana. I think our SS business, uh, our specific non-South African Sub-Saharan piece, probably mm. grew at about 8%. And you know we've grown that from from a very small base, so it just does keep ticking along, generally relatively close to double digits. Um, but we've put roots down, we've got brands, um, and, and people generally use those medicines and brands. We, uh, you know, we've been we've been, and we often sometimes the the only or the best manufacturer in some of those countries, the only one of of the, of the standards. So yeah, we we haven't had uh, we've been strong in East Africa. I am wary of of trading in Nigeria extensively than we, we do. So even just but, but, just looking at that uh, yeah. taken from your presentation on the screen there, it's interesting to note mm. very small in the USA relative to 
the rest of the world. And in fact, that that was the only area that fell in the past financial year. Do you want to talk to that quickly? Yes, it's largely a Canadian business. So I always laugh when I go and see other multinationals. They always say to me, you know, they've got US developed markets and then sort of rest of world. Uh, mm. And we're the only ones who've got uh, the US under rest of world. <laughs> got it the other one around. That's actually our Canadian business. We had a little problem with our supply of anesthetics in Canada. Canada, Canada is quite a big market as a single market for us. Uh, we've got a very smallish presence in the US um, and we tend to work through partnerships or through supply of other chemicals or let other we license products into the US market. If you're going to go into the US market, you've, you've really got to have a plan, a strategy and be prepared. Um, it looks big and it is big. And it looks exciting and it is exciting, but it doesn't come without risk. It's one of those markets where your insurance payment is is a percentage of your turnover. And that should be enough for to tell you a bit about regulars, regulators and regulation. Um, but we've got our hands full in the markets that we're in and we've got enough size and capacities for. And you've had long enough to work it out, as you've said, over the last few decades of running this business to know where you need to be focusing your attention. Adrian, uh, a follow-up from you? Well, I'm, I'm curious to know uh, if there is uh, anything sort of on the shopping list and, you know, that's obviously a sensitive uh, uh, aspect, but, you know, is there a sort of a go-to place either geographically or in terms of industry that, that appeals to you? Yeah, there are go-to. So, you know, when we built our first FDA plant, which uh, David uh, will remember and Alec some time back, and I remember one of the fancy managers at uh, Cape Town telling us that, you know, you, these are monument CEOs built to themselves. I said, look, I don't want CapEx. I don't want, uh, but I, but you know, that, that site that cost a hundred million now makes billions. <laughs> and mm. we've got to do something similar in our sterile. So what I should point out about our sterile business as it comes online, It'll give us at least 10% more margin in our anesthetic business, but we've got about 800 million more doses that we can manufacture. So that includes vaccines. So, you know, we really would, we've been in AIDS, we've done multi-drug resistant TB, we're doing the anesthetic, we've done dexamethasone, really like to be part of the COVID vaccine solution and be able to use our capacities and capabilities, particularly if we can contribute, if our production or portion of our production can go towards Africa. So uh, really would like to be a part of it and, and we're ready for that. So we've got those capacities, capabilities. And if you take 800 million units and you get even 10, 10 euro cents contribution, that's 80 million euros. If you get your own production, which is what ultimately we hope to get your own products, if you charge a dollar, a, a whatever presentation, you're on $800 million more. So that's something we, we find. Like. What we're also looking for is together with these multinationals, that are so focused on those core geographies for oncology is how do we partner you across Africa, Latin America, all these areas which are, are you know, when you're doing $20 billion in one drug, potentially, you really don't want to have a distraction. And who can take that distraction away from us, manage it without the Foreign Corrupt Practices Act, manage it in a way that a multinational feels comfortable. And, you know, the introduction in our business by bringing these multinationals through our manufacturing channel and, and the years of just delivery are, are what's helped, uh, it certainly helps put us on the map. We do many deals with the factory and products, you might have noticed. So if we get their factories, we fix their factories, but we say, okay, we want your products. We don't do it through information memorandums, Adrian. So I think you should see some bolt-on opportunities in those core, in our core geographies. Stephen, before David uh, picks up again, I'd love to know how government has viewed having Aspen in the country. Because as we, we've, we've looked at the deindustrialization of South Africa, we've lost many previously strategic industries. And here's one right now with COVID-19 that is about as strategic as it possibly could get. Is there a warm feeling towards you guys now that you're here? Because you've, you've crossed your swords in, in years gone by. <laughs> we did. Yeah, if you remember, right in the first in the ARVs at the beginning, we brought the ARVs into the country. Those were, were sad times, but you know, we just said we're doing this for the people. And in subsequent governments, pretty much changing well, government, changing personnel, uh, uh, we're, we're very aligned with where we were. 
we we really are getting a, a lot of encouragement and support and there's a lot of desire you know aspen's making the news on many in many fronts and anesthetics the exometer zone globally and you know hopefully we can contribute a little bit in the vaccine as well so yeah we get we get a lot of a lot of positives for it um and you know we are as a management team so committed to south africa uh, and committed to delivering drugs to everybody just those who can afford to fortune for them so I love that picture, and I think we need to put it up again uh, with your South African uh, scarf. Was this taken in Davos or at, uh, in your office? No, I haven't got I'm not like you, Alec. I haven't got time to go to Davos and all that. I'm a craft shop. Lovely scarf, though, anyway. <laughs> David? Steve, you, know, you know what's so fascinating? Uh, Stephen started off with SA Druggist, which was a very well-known business on the South African market. I mean, Stephen, you're a non-medical man. You're not a scientist. I mean, where did the learning come from and how, how have you managed to, um, I've got another question after this, but how, you know, just listening to you, how have you managed to keep up with what is today a very, very or extremely scientific uh, operation, you know, where, the, where we can't even pronounce the names you're talking about. Don't ask us to spell them, you know, let alone pronounce them. Well, you know, Look, where I'm probably a better pharmacist, comes? David, than I'm a chartered accountant now, I can assure you on that. <laughs> Certainly my best yeah. learnings were in South Africa and in the townships in a business mm. before Aspen, when, uh, and, and, uh, and when I used to go and see the individual doctors one by one. And you couldn't sit there and, you know, you, and so I sat and I listened and I heard and I, just, I got a very good understanding of need and where the opportunities lay in the South African market. And that is where the, so much of what Aspen was, was built on was that to understand people want a quality medicine, it's affordable and you can get to the masters that way. And that is the business that we were in. Um, how do we do it? We watch, we've got really good people in the business. They understand trends. They, I've got to, I've got to say, what does this do? How does this work? Um, and you, you get a sense, we, we got a sense from there. And uh, as I say, often our opportunities, we drive, we tend to drive our own opportunities rather than people bring them to us. I've learned as I've gone along, Dave, they've spent 20 years learning something. Mm -hmm. I, I remember bioavailability tests, which are to check how medicine works. I thought it was bioavailability. And I said, oh, no, you think your bio is available for that product. <laughs> <laughs> That was, that was my first year in the business. I didn't buy it. So I've learned that. I've got better as I've gone along. Well done, Professor. Alex, one lesson. You see what chartered accountants, you see what happens. If you go look at all the gold mines today, you go look at Goldfields, you go look at Durban Deep, all of those companies, and uh, uh, and you look throughout there. Once you've got a chartered account in their heads, you know, you know you're in the in line for success, you see. So... Well, you would say that, David. Uh, and, but, but to support you, totally unconflicted. Uh, our hero, Warren Buffett, says that the language of business is accounting. And if you don't understand accounting, how do you think you're ever going to understand business? But Adrian, you're also a CA, aren't you? Uh, I'm not, Alex. I'm I'm laughing Thank along goodness. here. Um, <laughs> I've got a, I've got a dad who's a CA, and much to his. Uh, much to his horror, I, I, I didn't follow the accounting route. So I've, uh, you know, I'm, I'm loving what is Stephen's description of how he's learned. You know, I've learned my my, my finance and my accounting um, at the coalface. Uh, I'm an economist by training, um, uh, but when you peel open uh, those financials, uh, boy, you better know what's going on there. I, I wanted just to close off with this, Stephen. Look at you talk about financials. Look at the. Uh, the, the debt uh, at Aspen, and maybe you can talk us through this because there was a lot of excitement in the in the market after the sale of your European thrombosis operation. Do you want to just uh, tell us a little more about why this is so relevant and uh, and why the uh, I'll pick it up in a moment. There we go. Um, now this is the net funding costs. Obviously, I've uh, I think it. Sorry, this was the the graph I wanted to show or the table from your presentation I wanted to pull out, because net funding costs, as we can see, are, are declining uh, quite significantly. And with the sale of that 650 million euro uh, unit, presumably a lot of that, I think you did say, was going to be put into further reducing debt. But at this point in the cycle, 
with debt costing so little, has it changed your, your view towards this? So if you go back, Alec, I think it was last year, December, we had 53, we had 53 billion rent, just over 53 billion. We were at 30 odd year, 35, I think. And you know, if you if you subtract the debt we get from thrombosis, it's it will come down to about 20 billion, just over 20. And our EBITDA will be about 11. So, you know, you've got less than probably two, two times, maybe less, maybe a little bit less and a significant reduction. So that's what brings your interest costs down or bring it down further together with rates. We very, we've very we got ourselves into a great position debt-wise now. I don't think we've been at this sort of low, by the time we consummate this transaction, I don't think we've been at these levels for maybe 10 years. And now you've got to decide what you do with it. So obviously you've got plenty of headroom to pay dividends and, and all of those good things. But we've also, going back to I think Adrian's first point, we've got to look very carefully at how we allocate capital and you know and, and looking at opportunities like the share buybacks and the program of share buybacks etc in these towns so we've got to look at that versus acquisitions versus filling and so we think we've got a lot of we've got some good upside in having good organic growth we if we get our sterols half right we're in a very good position and we do churn out a lot of cash that's one thing that aspen has always done in spite of heavy capex projects big acquisitions we're churning out cash um and so we Look very carefully how we spend that cash. Um, how do we look at it? We we really looking at it in terms of saying, do we pay a dividend? Do we do a share buyback? Do we do we do bolt on acquisition? Do we do all of the above? We're in a, we're in a pretty good position. I don't think you're going to see anything wildly transformative for us. We're not going to suddenly say we need a new oncology platform right now. We'd like to bank what we've got and deliver on here our platform. Over and above what we've delivered to date, but you're actually going to really deliver the knockout blow in terms of returns. And focusing on emerging markets. Yes. Bear in mind our manufacturing business is very focused on developed markets. You know, we've got good, we've got a lot of euro cost in our business. We've got facilities, so we we've got to have developed markets. And our manufacturing business is very supported by multinationals whose currency is either euros or dollars generally almost exclusively up in our business. So, uh, maybe Swiss francs as well. But uh, we've really got to, uh, you know, that part of our business is, is not really in emerging markets. But like commercial pharma business, definitely a focus on emerging markets. Just to close off with Stephen, I know you're a, you're a huge icon for many South Africans, but particularly in the Lebanese community. Is the, <laughs> is, <laughs> where, where does that uh, go back to? Uh, my parents are Lebanese, so you know, as they say, the Lebanese say, I'm, we're a chay from another bait, which means a, a brother from another mother. <laughs> so, <laughs> well, it's been wonderful having you today, and thank you so much for, for joining us, Stephen. Uh, David, do you want to put your camera back on? Um, and uh, and we can let Stephen go now as he's, uh, he's he's got a business to run. Could you give us your, your uh, thoughts? Uh, David, about what you've just heard, I I'm getting quite excited about the potential uh, for Aspen. Given that that yeah, you've got a an entrepreneur who's top of the world. Uh, he was he almost won the World Entrepreneur of the Year that Ernst and Young uh, event in 2005. Uh, I think they were they were just waiting, and the next year they gave it to Bill Lynch in 2006. So he, he he's he's his his pedigree is fantastic. He's also uh, fixed or spent an enormous amount of effort fixing it. He's relatively young at 55 when you compare with Warren Buffett, who's 90. So there's quite a lot of runway there still. Your thoughts? Look, I think it's been a tough journey. And I think Stephen's probably had maybe the, the worst 18 months or two years you know, that he's suffered in his business life. But I think at long last, we're in a situation now where you can hear from Stephen himself that uh, you know they're on the right track, and I think from now on it's going to be earnings driven. Once once the debt is down and we don't have this hanging over us, or we don't have any covenant issues. In other words, uh, you know, the people that you owe money starting to make demands from you and watching your balance sheet. It just allows him now to you know to focus on the business. And uh, certainly in, in, in most of his career, he's been very good at that. So I think, of course, at these levels, which is under 130, at 125 rand a share, um, it's, 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 you know, it is the time to start watching. So you know, good luck to Stephen. And he's the right kind of person with his team to take 
over. And at 55, he's still very, very young. Adrian, there's a share price graph, and as you can see, uh, we're getting um, well. There was a there was a big uplift after uh, COVID hit. Well, a, a quick knock, and then a then a nice uplift thereafter. But investors seem to have lost a bit of interest after it got to around 150. Of course, this is a long, long way from uh, the 400 rand a share that we saw a while ago. Yeah. Is it a time now, uh, given what you've heard, that you would be making a long-term investment? No, like I, I think that that's exactly the point. That investing uh, is is long term. Uh, it's about trying to work out uh, not where you're going to be next week or next month or next quarter, but uh, in ten years time. Uh, investing is a is a decade long or multi decade uh, event. And uh, from uh, from the chart that you've just had up, you can see uh, around about the time we entered, uh, which was uh, the second half of uh, 2019. Um, and uh, you know that the, the share price then uh, was under substantial pressure. Um, it was a fantastic entry point. <laughs> you you get some uplift, uplift uh, and the market likes to seduce you then with the belief that oh look you know we've we've got this all right and so now we can just sit back and <laughs> back and wait and you know there there was a correction. But you know what's what Stephen is pointing to and what David has alluded to is uh, this is a global business which has got all of the right drivers. Um, it's got technologies that are advanced market. Uh, it's got markets that are emerging market and quick grown. Um, it's a scale business, uh, so you can't do this uh, in small doses and little increments, bad pun, not intended. Um, uh, uh, it, is, it is a scale business. Um, what what I really like in this story is what, what COVID has driven home is the importance of healthcare. So often, uh, when you're in conversations about countries and you know what 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 makes a country work well, it's about policy and 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 investors and education and and technology and infrastructure. Take healthcare away, and your country has failed. And mm -hmm. and I love what Aspen has got in that basket. It has got a critical ingredient to. To, to, to social prosperity, to global mm -hmm. prosperity. And uh, you know, Stephen is making the point that you're buying it at eight times EBITDA. If you go to the bottom line, it's 10 times. Uh, I think that this is a compelling valuation for a business of this quality and, and, and with this portfolio. I think it's a compelling valuation. Uh, COVID, post COVID, would this be a business that would benefit uh, if you have a look ahead for in the medium term, David? Yeah, and, and how? You know why? It's a point that I'm, I'm just sorry I never discussed with Stephen as well. The one thing that COVID has taught us is how important healthcare is. We were caught mm -hmm. unawares. No country is going to find themselves in a situation that they found themselves in now. It's not going to happen again. More and more money is going to be spent on research, development, hospitals, um, particularly on the technology side of it. You can expect, you know, new diagnostic machines. You can't have tests that, uh, that are going to take a week to get the results from, you know, should something like this uh, uh, arise again. So we're going into a period now where countries are not going to allow their health care or their public health system to, to be caught again like this. So what I'm saying is that, you know, that's what I find quite compelling about uh, the pharmaceutical industry is that I think more and more money is going to be invested in it. Um, and, and, and I think that the, the noise about reducing prices is just going to be political rhetoric. I don't think they can follow through with it because they can't afford not to have the scientists or not to have uh, the money spent on developing new drugs. Adrian, as a professor at Gibbs as well, you look at a lot of businesses in South Africa. There can't be too many champions in the in the mold of uh, an Aspen. Perhaps Discovery uh, would be one, Investec to, a, I guess, a lesser degree. And then you start running out of names pretty quickly. Uh, but this is a business that has got plants all over the world, uh, as we saw earlier from the uh, from the tables. It's South African business is a relatively small part of the whole global cake. So as a consequence of that, add overlay uh, what both of you have just been saying about healthcare getting more important. 
you'd have to scratch your head to to wonder why you shouldn't be buying the business at this point. But what am I missing here? Well, I don't, you know, I don't want to argue that you, you, you're not missing anything because uh, investing is never uh, is never that straightforward uh, or simple. You know, just when you think you've nailed it, uh, something jumps out the cupboard and whacks you. But you know, the the, the points that I point uh, that I suggested about the quality of the portfolio, the diversification. Uh, Stephen was at pains to point out that this is a strong cash flow business. Um, uh, and I need to be careful here, surrounded by accountants. But uh, um, <laughs> as what Damodaran says, you know, when uh, when you see footnote one twenty eight uh, in financials, <laughs> what, what does that tell you? And it tells you that there's one hundred and twenty seven footnotes before it. Um, <laughs> So as much as we can talk about the accounting results, what, what I'm always at pains to point out in, in our investment process um, uh, is, is cash flow. And this business has demonstrated uh, the, the quality of that cash flow. It's, it's helped now by the much easier interest rate environment and by the, the good prices it's achieving in the sale of assets, uh, that milk business in particular. So, uh, you know, put all of these together, uh, I, I, you know, I don't want to suggest it's a slam dunk that'll come back to bite me, but it's got all of the ingredients of a really good uh, investment. And I'm not talking about the next 12 months. I'm talking about the next 12 years. This is a business that I think you can buy for a long time. The Buffett story, David, your mm. average holding period forever. You'd be happy if the stock yeah. markets were closed for five years and you came back and Aspen was in your portfolio? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I, look, I think I think Stephen's going to do it, but but um, I, you know I've always been an admirer of his, and and it's just wonderful to see him again. But but Alec, the point that you make about Buffett, I think the more I live through the markets now. And the more I have to suffer these 10% up one days and 10%, the more I start to say, you know, Buffett is so right. Just let's let's open up. Let, let's just turn on the screen once a year and see where we are. I think I'd feel a lot more happy. The only thing that we do have to uh, minister is, is is client expectations. So choosing companies is easy. You know, that's pretty simple. Managing client expectation, not so easy. So, yeah. But I, 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 I endorse what Buffett says, you know, just, just uh, you, you, you know, there's certain businesses that you don't have to keep looking at all the time, although circumstances do change, yeah. Before we close off, Adrian, you're not going to be with us next week, but your thoughts on a question we should be asking Alan Pullinger from First Rand? Yeah, uh, um, it, it's great to be uh, with you guys today. So thank you for, for the invitation. Um, and I'd love to join you on, on other occasions. The banking environment uh, is, visibility is so poor. And you know, these guys are at the coalface. So uh, you know, that's what I want to know is what are they seeing um, in terms of the, of the, the hand, sort of the hand-to-hand -hand combat? Um, is, uh, you know, uh, how, are we at the bottom? Have we been through the worst? If these banks have taken uh, all of the pain, then these are good valuations. Then you're buying these banks at book value and less. Um, first round, I think, has separated itself from the market at large by the, by the quality of the business. It's really demonstrated over long times, extraordinary entrepreneurial uh, endeavor. Um, and, uh, and I think that that's the other aspect is, uh, how does this environment change the, uh, the business response? So, you know, for the sake of a throwaway, what's the entrepreneurial thing that pops out of this, uh, if anything, or is it batten down the hatches and wait for the storm to pass? Adrian Saville, thank you from um, Canon Asset Management, yeah. David Shapiro, as always. Uh, we'll be back again, Dave and I, next week. Koki will be with us uh, to talk banks with Alan Pullinger. And uh, thanks again to Stephen Saad for uh, giving, giving up so generously of his time and his insights and uh, in helping us to understand his business, Aspen Group, much better. From me, Alec Hogg, until the next time, cheerio. Thank you.